Feldig. I'm the executive director of I-10. And um, tough crowd. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Tough crowd. Uh -oh. um, thank you for joining us tonight. For those of you who may not know, I-10 is a nonprofit organization that is a catalyst for tech innovation. And what that means is we uh, support uh, tech innovators and entrepreneurs uh, through the commercialization of successful tech startup companies. Um, so we work with companies that have scalable innovative technology across industry sector. Our programs and services are provided all free of charge to um, tech entrepreneurs. So um, tonight we are here um, kind of focusing on one of our program elements, our investor readiness program, which Mock Angels is part of that. If you think Shark Tank is kind of like a Shark Tank uh, process they go through where they uh, get experience pitching to a panel of investors and these wonderful people sitting here are some of our most recent graduates and they're going to tell you a little bit about what's going what they do and what's going on in their world but before we go there I mentioned that um, I-10 is celebrating our 10th anniversary uh, this year we have worked with over 900 tech startups uh, in the St. Louis region and even a little bit broader we've had some companies uh, from Kansas City, Springfield, and Des Moines uh, use our programs and services. Um, this year's been an exciting year for us. We added five new board members as well. Um, so we're continuing to grow and be a very important part of the tech innovation community. We onboarded 74 new companies this year. Um, so every month we bring in uh, new companies and get them onboarded and involved in our programs and services. And um, right now, we probably have about 247 active uh, companies that are, we're working with. So they're engaging and using our programs and services uh, to help uh, move and advance their tech company forward. On the Mock uh, Angels Investor Readiness side, uh, this year we graduated three companies. We have six in process, and probably about three that are going to graduate in right January, after the first year. Right after the first of the year. People got a little busy. Um, Happy to say that several of our companies um, are Arch Grants companies, so um, that kind of took them aside for a little bit while they went through that process, but uh, they've continued to re-engage with us. Um, for those mock angel graduates that we've had over the years, to date, they have raised, raised close to $200 million in funding. So as a measure of success of that program, obviously, is their ability, uh, after we work, we kind of run them through the grind of doing the investor pitches is can they really go out and raise money and in fact they have. So 250 million have been raised by our Mock Angel graduates. Also, um, not only raising the money but operating successful ventures, 77% of our Mock Angel graduate companies are producing revenue and creating jobs. So again, economic impact for the region. God bless you. Um, what else? Uh, this year, um, we also, and really our primary focus is on our entrepreneurs, but we also do community engagement work so that, um, you know, we're reaching the broader community. We have a corporate innovation program. If anyone is interested in hearing about that, we'll be happy to share information with you on that. And we also do other programs in the community around diversity and inclusion, vision symposium. Uh, we've been a lead organizer of that for the fourth year now. So, with that, uh, again, I want to thank you all for coming, and um, let's get to business. So I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, who is going to introduce you to our wonderful panel of entrepreneurs and get the show started. Thanks. Thanks, Danelle. Um, hi, my name is Melissa Grizzle. I'm the Director of Entrepreneur Development with I-10, um, which means I oversee a lot of our programs and get to work with um, with a lot of these fabulous companies. Program. So I'm excited to have um, a sampling of our fabulous Mock Angel graduates. We have um, the three that graduated this year, um, three of the um, seven that graduated last year, and, one, and I think Brian, you speak to the end of 2016, yeah, right? Yeah. So, we, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you don't need to hear anything more from me. Um, so, kicking us off tonight is Jessica Gordon. Also, let's also, so you're going to speak. Um, she's going to give you a quick elevator pitch, a few tidbit, great tidbit updates about what's going on in her world, and then we're going to leave it open for a Q and A for you at the end. Does that sound good? Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Razi. We have an online learning platform to teach students about careers. 
We worked with 700 schools across the country um, last year. We did about a half million in revenue. Um, this year we're on track to do between 1.4 and 1.7 million. Um, after um, Mac Angels, we closed our, um, our round of seed funding, so we are using that for our rapid um, for rapid growth right now, and we're expecting to bring on um, right around 1,500 schools this year. Um, and our retention rate is over 70%, which is very high in the ad tech industry. The average rate is usually about their, um, 10%. Um, so we're quickly growing, um, and we have a lot going on right now. Let's go ahead and run through oh. everybody do their pitches and then we'll yeah. just so we can make sure everybody yeah. gets it. Next up, um, Joshi Fang with Applied Particle Technology. Hi, uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Applied Particle Technology. Um, every year people are going to work and getting sick. That's because they're getting exposed to harmful airborne pollutants. Uh, the current technologies right now are actually they're using filter samples, so they're actually collecting dust, sending them to a lab and getting them analyzed and waiting two weeks for the results uh, during that time which they might be potentially exposed. And so right now they don't really have any good tools or technology. So we developed the world's for, uh, smallest wearable exposure monitor. Uh, they can turn it on, uh, clip it on, and then get real-time exposure data. It's a wireless device that they can transmit and see the data centrally. Uh, so you can monitor a lot of workers at the same time. Uh, this is a technology that's developed by WashU PhDs. Uh, and so some of our first customers include the Environmental Protection Agency and some local manufacturing companies. Um, and some quick updates. We're partnering with some regulatory agencies like the California Department of Health, uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health to test and validate our devices. We have our monitors in the city of uh, Delhi at the U.S. Embassy. Apparently the air quality there is pretty bad. It's worse than the air quality uh, in, during the California wildfires, which is pretty surprising. And then uh, most recently we took our uh, sensors to NASA uh, for a competition and uh, we beat out two other teams uh, for the NASA Earth Space Air Prize. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Blance and I'm the founder and CEO of Gift-A-Meal. Gift-A-Meal is a mobile app that helps to provide a meal to someone in need in our community each time you take a photo at a partner restaurant. Restaurants are paying us a monthly subscription to be on the app as a marketing service and then it's free for all of you to just go to the restaurant, click on them, take a photo, use location to make sure you're there, and we make a donation to local food bank in St. Louis, that's Operation Food Search. Um, so currently we have 150 partner restaurants, so if you're looking for some place around here, Vizia or the Chocolate Pig or Juniper, uh, Narwhals, there are a ton of restaurants uh, here on Gift Meal. Um, we currently have nearly 20,000 people on the app and we've provided 196,000 meals to date, so we're going to hit 200,000 by New Year's. Uh, we were recently named an Arch Grant recipient and closed an $165,000 seed round to help take us to the next level. And we're nearing being ready to post, we haven't posted yet, um, a job opportunity to have a chief technology officer uh, come on board onto your team. Uh, currently, we have an app development company that we've outsourced to. Um, we plan on keeping them and having the CTO oversee them as well as getting their hands dirty. So looking for someone who's a full stack developer, has a little bit of experience either in corporate or startup, and looking for a change, uh, and wants to be working at a high strategic level as well as getting their hands dirty. Um, so we can really blow things up, this up and take a nice Thank you. Just by a quick show of hands, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you either got locked out of your home, lost your keys, or, or had a hard time accessing uh, apartment? Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> now imagine the same problem, thousand times worse. Residential rental property managers who are managing scattered rentals, they have to solve this problem every single day over and over and over again. When somebody loses a key, when somebody calls for a maintenance, like plumbing or electricity, or when an apartment is turned over when you have to show it to a bunch of strangers at different times. Uh, I've experienced the problem myself, and that's why my team and I built Keybot, which is right there. Uh, and uh, uh, we, um, we essentially have a smart lock for property managers who are managing residential rental properties across the town, uh, or scattered rental properties. 
Uh, we graduated from uh, Mock Angels last year. Uh, we are a team of four. And after graduating from Mock Angels, uh, we actually ended up doing three accelerators at the same time in three different continents. Wow. Uh, my co-founder moved to Taiwan to focus on the hardware. I moved to London to participate in Techstars. And uh, our third partner, TJ Tavares, he ended up going to Kansas City to participate in Sprint Accelerator. Uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, we have we focus on large property managers who are at least uh, who are managing at least thousand rentals. Uh, we have two customers. One customer right here in St. Louis, and another customer is in California. Uh, and as a matter of fact, my whole team is in California. We have a field test this week, which is going really really well, and we are crossing the finger that we can convert them in a long term contract. Uh, and uh, we have raised half million dollars uh, in seed funding. And Next year, we are just looking to start mass production of the product, uh, hopefully starting from 1st of January. Thank you. Next up, Brian Sapper. Hi, Brian. The company's name is Sensor Tracks. I couldn't afford all the vowels, but I nice support the company. <laughs> <laughs> Sensor Tracks is really kind of like a Fitbit for manufacturing machines. And I know you're thinking, okay, so you guys develop the sensor and you smack it on the side of a machine and you can tell me how it's running or walking or how many steps it got in the day. And while that, that's kind of true, but it's kind of not, most manufacturing equipment today already has the sensors in it that you need to understand how it's running. And so we actually have a software product that connects directly to those sensors in the equipment, extracts the data, and really makes it meaningful for the manufacturers and it helps them improve their uh, processes and really lower costs and produce more with, with this stuff. Uh, we have two products. One is called the Manufacturing Analytics product. It's for companies that make things. So watches, badges, cups, auto parts, whatever, you name it. And it helps them increase uptime of their equipment, produce better products, and also produce it faster. We have another product called the OEM Analytics product, which is targeted towards machine manufacturers, the people that build the equipment that make these cups, these tables, whatever it is. And it helps them monitor their machines at customer sites because the better they can understand how they're being used, they can build better product, provide better customer service, provide different warranties based on how the machines are being used, and actually get more money out of providing service to their customers. So we have a very heavy focus on the auto parts industry. Fits very well with our software, but we have companies in all kinds of different manufacturing verticals. We have Probably the most oddball one is a company that makes the fibers that go in diapers. Didn't really know that was a thing. I mean, I assumed that was a thing, but, uh, you know, so we have wire manufacturers. We have people that assemble pizzas and um, pizzas and sandwiches. Like, you ever had a Red Baron pizza? It was made on equipment of one of our customers. Um, over the last three years, we were founded in 2015. We've grown quite a bit. We were an Arch Grants recipient in 2016. Like Melissa said, we graduated from Mock Angels in 2017. We got an investment from a strategic investor in 2018. We also went through the Ameren Accelerator. And all that stuff is good. A lot of people measure startup success by that, but I measure it by revenue. So we have grown revenue eight times between 2017 and 2018. We've also added five people to the team. So 2018 has been a good year for us. And then in 2017, um, sorry, also this year we formed a lot of partnerships with a lot of industry folks. So we're now partners with Siemens and tightly integrated into their software products that go out on the manufacturing floor. Also a bunch of different sensor companies because we don't actually make the Fitbit that I said before. So if we have older machines that doesn't have the sensors, we have partnered with people that make those. Uh, also partnering with some software companies to help us integrate with other software on the manufacturing floor. So 2019 for us is really just about sales growth. We have a proven product, great case studies, and now it's just how do we blow up the company? And that's what we're focusing on. Next up, Brian cloud-based enterprise software platform that handles, manages actually, and calculates the benefits under economic development incentives. So really what that means are when companies add jobs and they apply for incentives from any government, there's a very tedious process that actually goes into calculating the benefit and taking that on your tax return or getting the cash. Something that used to take six hours, I can do in 15 minutes with the software. It's a very tedious, it was a very tedious process, now it's not so much. 
We were um, an arch grant winner as well this year. We are bootstrapped so far, so we're at that stage where you know we, we probably um, have enough, I guess, prospects that we should think about raising. We're not, we're not quite sure. It's kind of on the cusp, and um, so we're revenue positive this year. We also, gosh, what else happened? We have a patent that's pending, and um, we were nominated or yes, voted by other St. Louis companies as one of the most innovative companies in St. Louis or in Missouri for 2018. specifically for verified nonprofits here in the US. Uh, so you know that feeling that we get when we're, we've got a ton to get done and not nearly enough time to do it all? That's what a nonprofit professional feels like every single day, uh, especially the days that they're fundraising, right? So we take an hour of a nonprofit's time and we turn that single hour into thousands of dollars of revenue and strengthen connections with current donors and new donors over the course of 30 to 60 days, right? So I'm gonna jump into uh, like recent achievements and improved metrics here in a minute, but I really wanna focus on like the most exciting part of what we get to do, which is our social impact. So Glanitude has provided us with the opportunity to make an enormous impact uh, in, in lives of people all over the world. And so, like, kids in Honduras who were thought to be deaf, like, got to see a ear, nose, and throat doctor and can hear him, right? Or, uh, like, women in Uganda and their babies who are cast out of their home because they think that an obstetric fistula means that they're cursed, like, have been given piglets and their lives are changed. Now their community, or their, their leaders in their community because they're generating revenue and they're able to gift piglets to their neighbors who could also use one. Uh, and my favorite story <laughs> is about this guy named Wilson. And Wilson is from the Kairiba uh, slums in Kenya, and he was a thief. <clears throat> and he wasn't a thief because he wanted to be a thief. He was a thief because his circumstances necessitated that he steal to survive. And then one day he was shown that there was another way and that if he could start a savings account without stolen money, that one of our nonprofit <laughs> partners would um, make a micro loan to Wilson. And so he started a savings account. The loan was made. Today he owns a grocery store with his mom. They have an employee and he bought a house outside of the slums with indoor plumbing, uh, glass windows, and a tile roof. So it hasn't taken a lot of money to have this impact, but the money that it did take was raised on gratitude, which is cool. Um, but actually, we've had over a million dollars raised on the platform. <clears throat> that happened this year. It was a huge milestone for us to reach. Uh, we've had over 4,000 donations processed through the platform. Uh, our website was lucky or unlucky enough to go viral once for a campaign that we ended up having to remove from the platform. Uh, at its peak, we were receiving one complaint per minute, and that lasted for about eight hours. Uh, so a ton of traffic that our site held up to. Um, we had to tweak the model a number of times to get to a place where it could work like this. Uh, so we started with a Kickstarter starter model. It was so effective at making a nonprofit raise their money, but so stressful that they never want to do it again. We switched to kind of a flexible funding model that gave them the ability to collect money as they raised it and found out that they liked that model a lot more but weren't nearly as successful at reaching their goal. So then we switched to a model where we were really holding their hand and providing a step-by-step -step formula for them to follow. And nonprofits did great at that. Some of them did, and some of them did nothing at all. So we just stepped back uh, the last few months and really dug into our data, we found out that if a nonprofit raises 45% of their goal in their first campaign, they use us over and over and over again. And about 30% of our customers fall into that cohort 
Zero of them have churned. We haven't had a single customer leave us that has reached 45% of their goal. Um, and if they don't raise to 45% of their goal, they don't even reach 10% of their goal, right? uh, because they don't do anything. So we found out that the steps that it takes to raise successfully through like a crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer campaign, the technology exists to automate them and personalize them, right? Which means that a Missouri History Museum or a Boys and Girls Club of St. Louis should never ever fail again on our platform because now we can run the campaigns for them and we can optimize those cam that messaging in those campaigns specifically for each individual donor, right? Um, what happens is we start collecting data, we learn from that data, we make better decisions, we grow faster, we collect more data, and there starts to become a data network effect. That's, we're beginning to see that. So uh, it's been a really good 2018 for us. All of those things have kind of come together and got us uh, our first acquisition offer from a private equity firm in New England. Uh, and we feel confident enough about our future that we said hell no. <laughs> or been really, really close to that before. And they are given 15 minutes to do their pitch. In the balance of the hour, they get feedback, <coughs> a lot of tough love um, from the group, not only about um, the content of their pitch, but the way that they um, presented it, the way it was structured, the way the story was told. Um, and uh, they take all that feedback in. We video that hour. We send them home with the video. We, we compile all the written um, quantitative and qualitative um, data. They go back, they crunch on that, they and then come back usually within a couple of months for their graduation pitch. And like that to be a little bit shorter, crisper, um, and have addressed the issues um, and uh, met with the um, mock angels that have indicated on their first pitch that they would, would like to help them. Uh, and then we also work with them um, on building a deal room, on doing their deal with this structure. So we, when they graduate from the program, they have a, a tight pitch and they have um, the sets of documents that. Uh, an early stage investment group is going to going to be asking for. So, that said, um, I would love to hear um, from our panelists what was something. What was like the biggest thing you change you made from your initial to your grad, or came in you, know, you had to go home and crunch on and really think hard on and change in order to come back. Uh, so I have the tech platform, uh, so it's really hard for us because we never know how much information to include on the education side of things. So you might be wondering why kids need to learn about careers in kindergarten, because they're in kindergarten. Um, so our um, Mac Angels are really good about helping us like, hone in on what information would be pertinent and interesting to investors so that they can focus more on our numbers and our revenue instead of being kind of held up on wait a second, like our kindergartners and cubicles, like what, what do they have to do? Um, so that was really helpful for us is more like on the messaging or on the product side um, so that we can like really focus on like the numbers and how our company is scaling. Two things really. Um, I had never raised money before, went through that even though I had owned another company for 18 years. And um, one of the things that I really learned was the product matters less in an investor pitch. Like you have to talk about it, but it's, it's minimal. It's not like what you're talking about in a, um, when you're trying to sell something, which is all you do is talk about. Uh, and then the other part of it was, I was always used to selling to, it's kind of like what Jessica said, a, a, an audience that knew the industry extremely well, and you're selling to an audience that doesn't know it very well, and they have a lot of assumptions about it, so really simplifying the message so that they can understand it, that was very, very it's still not simple. But it, was, it was a big help. Um, but I went through it actually. I think it was very least that said our value proposition uh, wasn't good enough. When we started Gladitude, we really just kind of wanted to be like, like our hope was that we could be like a GoFundMe 
for nonprofits where if we provide the platform, then they do all the work. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was pointed out that they, they might not actually know what work to do. And so it kind of changed our model in that we put a lot more focus on like the hand holding of our customers than we kind of was there before. I, th I think a lot of what, what previous folks have said is absolutely true. I think for us it was around simplification of the story. Also, um, also uh, making sure the the market, like the market we were going after, did we have the right numbers behind it? Did we have a, a really, really crisp message for investors? Uh, and I think that was really, I mean, after going through several uh, conversation with uh, our advisors, it was really clear for us, like, okay, we are not telling a good story. We are, we think we know what we are doing, but when people hear us, they hear gibberish. They're like. You don't, we don't understand. We understand the product, but we don't understand the market you're going after. Or how are you going to approach that market? So after going through that session and getting that feedback and correcting that, it was a huge deal for us. I think for us, it was sifting through all of the different pieces of advice that everyone gave us. So when you go through Mock Angels, you get a different panel each time. It's not the same set of people. You know, you may get someone who knows your industry. Not many people know mine necessarily. It's kind of more of a niche, but it does impact anybody who has a company. If you're growing jobs, you should be getting those benefits. Most companies don't know about it, so we hope to level the playing field. What I found was when I talked about it, if you explain it differently, the more analogies you use, the more people seem to pick up on it. And you, you over time learn that you pick a little bit of advice from a lot of different people and put it together, that works for a few days, and then you scrap that and you go again and you just keep working on it. I think it's always, for me, it's always a work in process to get that message to the people that are in my audience because it's always gonna change. I don't always know who they're gonna be. So you just want to have at least one phrase that somebody can resonate with. So we tell people we're H&R Block for incentives. Some people get that. Some people are like, what is H&R Block? <laughs> yeah, same for me, I think. Um, coming from a research background, being like pretty technical, figuring out how to communicate um, to investors and potential customers, and just think about the business long term. Um, you know, I felt like we were pretty good at building the solution, but understanding you know, details of the value proposition and why people really want to use our device uh, did not come naturally. And uh, having Mark Angel's guide us through that process was uh, incredibly important because um, knowing the technology is better is not really enough. You really have to understand why your customer uses it and how it really simplifies and makes their life easier and saves them money. Um, there are a couple big takeaways that we took away from the process. Uh, first was how to pitch a mobile app built around photos of food as something that was a business that would be sustainable, uh, something <laughs> investable, uh, especially a social impact organization, um, showing that it could be profitable for investors and how to pitch that. Um, then also looking at what the strategic focus was going to be as we look to scale, how to hone in our pitch in terms of to restaurants and show that we were valuable, and also the goals to increase user retention. And then if you saw my notebook of afterwards, all the different notes I had from uh, everybody that gave advice and a bunch of micro level things that you know butterfly effect out and uh, really helped us uh, to grow. Um, it was cool as well, and those questions on the first pitch. Um, but one of the mock angels judges ended up being the first investor to commit to our next round of funding. Um, and so he was able to see the pitch all the way through and then was the first to commit, which then led to more people coming in. And through that process, I was able to see uh, something that might seem obvious to some, that basically if you make yourself very transparent and vulnerable to investors and you're showing what your flaws are and what you're good at, then investors have more trust in you and you have a first data point, a second data point, a third data point, and then you're ready to invest. Um, they believe in you, trust you as an entrepreneur. So that was the lesson that was taught to us in the process. You guys, I think, answered two other forms of questions I was going to ask. But no, that's great. You know, because um, I think just uh, hearing well, you know, a little bit about your process and kind of the things that you had to change. What would you, would you, did you change, would you say more what you said the second time or your actual physical slides? Because I know we give a lot of feedback like, 
you've got a great story, but you're telling it horribly. And, you, you know, Jack's here, I called him, I know, you need to blow up that slide deck and start over. You know, so you, you need to structure it differently. So what did you work more on? What came out of your mouth, or what was actually behind you while you were talking? Anybody had to blow up their slide deck, raise their hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Many times. <laughs> Yeah, I think a big thing was like realizing that it, you could have a, like you could literally have, you could pack a thousand reasons why someone should invest in your pitch deck. And if you have one disqualifier, like that's it, you're disqualified. Good point. Yeah. Everybody looks for the numbers, right? Yeah. When you're looking at a pitch deck, you want to know why it won't work, why you wouldn't want to put any money in there. Because you only have, if you're an investor, you only have a certain amount of money to invest. And so if you're going to look at 10 different companies, and you want to get through those and find the one, you're going to listen to them and just look for the one reason you can say no and get them out of the way and move on to the next one. So that's... Um, you're I talking think. like somebody who's on the other side. Of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, okay, full well, disclosure. Yeah, full well, disclosure. One of our EIRs. That, um, so I want to open it up to the room if you guys have questions for any or all of our panelists on their experience. Brian? So my question is... Uh, uh, so as a social enterprise, like I'm pretty sure there's somebody who's like, oh, like you're 18 months away from being invested in because we don't know if it's going to be your return. Um, but there's other people who look at you and say, no, this is a social impact and you're in your returns in social impact. So did you ever have to um, maybe even think about, you know, like what your company is and even doubt yourself as you are uh, coming in and making your changes as your company grows and you know it makes those connections and makes those because like I mean you're also like just graduating college and like so you know you have a lot of different things you have imposter syndrome most people that you talk to are not your age so like you know to walk me through that thought process yeah uh, good questions so one thing with gift a meal um, that I'll emphasize is that we are a for-profit company and we're very proud of that. Um, I'm a big believer that profits and purpose are not inconsistent goals. And with Gift Meal, we hope that we're able to show to other companies that you can become more profitable by having social impact. And as we get more profitable, we're able to make a bigger social impact. It's kind of this circle of effect we can have both. Um, it was a question that investors asked in terms of priorities, in terms of social impact versus making money for them. Um, because sometimes investors might not be an impact investor. And so they primarily want to focus on their wallet. And so with that, I just had to show the value to them of the opportunity, finding the comparable exits in our space for our core value, uh, and then show social impact as part of our core. We're not changing that, um, and make sure that they're on board and what I'm trying to do. Um, in terms of imposter syndrome and just being out of college and everything, um, I've actually found that to being young as an entrepreneur to be a benefit rather than a hindrance in the sense that people have been a lot more willing to help. Um, and also a lot of our investors ended up being people that we just reached out to for help or that were connected to me to get advice. And you know the saying is if you ask for money, you get advice. If you ask for advice, you get money. Um, <laughs> and so this last round was consistent of all people that I've been usually connected to for advice. Um, only one was somebody who was contacted directly because of an investor. I mean, nine investors in this last round. Um, so yeah, I think that overall, <coughs> investors don't care about age. They care about the return they're going to make you. Uh, they're going to make on you, um, and social impact as long as you show it's something that's still going to be a benefit to them, or it's something that they just care about social impact, and that's what you care about, then great. Um, in our case, we're saying we can make a big impact, and we feel good about it, and we're going to make you a lot of money. Uh, Andrew is actually our example of a, a really good initial pitch. Like after he did his initial pitch, I said, do I have permission to share for, your initial pitch? And say, yeah, as an example of this is well struck, I mean, not that you didn't have room to grow between yeah. initial and grad, but structure, execution, you know, so, yeah. Did you have follow I'm sorry, Brian, I kind of have to give I was, I was going to say, like, I always go back, like, in, like, I, I mean, I might not talk to you that much, but, like, in in where I'm from, in my college, I always talk about Gift to Meal because, like, a lot of kids, uh, a lot of, well, a lot of people that are just getting out of college or are starting companies from my school. And like they are, but they fall flat because like they get up and move away and they get out. And like it's like there's an opportunity out here. I'm like, look, there's people just like us 
creating companies and are winning and like look and like and now that like companies from SI from my school are getting out there like Eli um, Eli's from SIU uh, what uh, I'm trying to, he does like zoo technology uh, Eli Ball yeah Eli Ball like and there's like more people from my school like like getting out there and like and I'm just very happy that I'm like you know. To eat to any time I even say like to a restaurant like hey you should sign up and give me because I think that it should be more of us coming up and not just going to get a job and starting a company and doing that and creating that social impact because that's the new wave of the future. But whatever. Can I say something about the imposter syndrome thing? So I think if everybody has it. I'm 44. This is my third company. I've sold two other ones. I still have it. I think it's healthy because it keeps you humble. Right. You don't want to advice. Well, I think it's sometimes when that tech side age gets, yeah. so, you know, sometimes people will look at Andrew and go, he knows tech more than right. than us, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of curiosity, did anyone actually survey your potential client base to see what they needed and wanted? Yes. So, could you talk so, about that? Oh yeah, that sounds good. So my company started as an accident. Um, I, <laughs> I was in a PhD program and while I was doing my research, I realized kids weren't learning about careers. So I wrote a children's book based on feedback. And then the schools contacted me that they wanted to buy curricula. And I said, that's a cool idea. I'll sell something for $1,000 that I made. Or that I made, there was no company or company name, but I made this thing and I sold it for a thousand dollars, and then I did it ten times again, and then I, someone said you're like supposed to go to a lawyer to like register an LLC, right? <laughs> so then it went from there. Um, so we have like a very like grind mentality. Like I sold my first product from a need, um, and now I do the same thing. I make four samples of every program. I pre-sell the program. If I get enough pre-sells, then I make the program and it funds it. So all of our fundraising money is only for scaling, team, marketing, um, those types of things. Um, it's always off of a need and or I don't make a product line. Yeah, I, spent, I spent 18 years doing <laughs> other manufacturing technology and I kind of saw a need. Um, and what it, I went to a Microsoft conference and Satya Nadella, the CEO, gave a presentation about the Internet of Things and monitoring, you know, like a pump, a well, oil well pump in the middle of Texas where there's the pump and a cap. Like, there's the only thing that's there. <laughs> and and um, I, I looked at that and thought, wow, like a lot of the customers that we had at my other company could use that because they were machine builders, right? So they could use that to pull data out of machines in, in a factory. Right, do everything that I explained in my in my pitch. So I sold that company to go off and do this idea. And I spent three months trying to find um, different manufacturers that I could pre-sell this product to, kind of like what Jessica was saying, because I wanted to fund the company, you know, fund the revenue. And um, what I found out was nobody would buy that product. Like they weren't ready for it. Like the machine builders weren't ready for that. Their customers weren't ready for that. They didn't understand the business model that they could create from it. And frankly, most of them still don't, like the manufacturing analytics. So I kept hearing over and over again, we need better data from the factory, right? So we need, it's completely invisible to us, and we need to make it visible. And so that's the product they ended up building. You know, if I didn't survey the customers, I would have been broke, you know? I mean, I would have had a failed company if I didn't spend those three months um, asking them what they wanted, and I found my first customer out of that, which got me the second one, and you know, I got one now. So it's good. Well done. So I think like Brian, I was in, Incentives. I was a corporate tax director for many years and other background, but I'd been working in incentives for about 10 or 15 years and we used Excel to these very complicated models where your formula bar would be three rows of formulas, if ands, all these conditionals, which I should have, should have done coding a long time before that, but the last time my model blew up, I thought, that's it, this is crazy, I'm going to do software, because I knew my peers were, were all having the same issues, and you can put it in Access, which is great, much better product. But when you hand that off to your client, they don't want it. They want Excel. They want to be able to see what you're doing. So it, it was really born out of necessity, I think. Hopefully. <coughs> you're saying cloud, the software as a service model sounds better than an Excel spreadsheet. It does. It does. Right? It, yeah, it sounds like you should pay more for it, too. <laughs> in our case, uh, yeah, in our case, I think what we started as a software company, uh, we did not want to build 
And uh, every, uh, we were a big fan of the book, uh, book written by Google called Sprint, which essentially, in less than five days, uh, can you validate your assumption? So, uh, as a matter of fact, we used to use the Venture Cafe a lot. Every Thursday, we'll come out here, whatever product we're building, we'll either sell to potential renters and then go to landlords and try to sell it to them as a software product. And after trying it several times, we were trying to be a leasing automation company. And it wasn't selling. We, we got into a bunch of real estate conventions and people were not buying it and were like, this doesn't make sense. So we, so we decided like, well, my co-founder Adam was from Collinsville. Uh, he was like, dude, I don't know what to do. Was like, well, let's go to a place where nobody knows us. So we got like north of Collinsville, there was a small real estate investor club and we said, this is what we do. We have this software, we have this potential hardware and all this stuff and, and they were like really excited. They're, oh, this is so cool. Can you come back here next month? and pitch to all of, our, uh, all of our real estate investors what you do. I was like, yeah, but before you go there, uh, let me announce you what you guys do. I'm like, yeah, great. And so she, she didn't know how to pronounce my name, so she was like, Fish from St. Louis, and Adam from our town, Collinsville, they build this awesome product where you just put lock on the door so you don't have to drive to your rental property. And we're like, no, we have a lot more. And, and we were like, nope, that's our product. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's what the customer really, really wanted. And we had 90% okay. of the product yeah. stuff we had built, we were like, all right, we're just going to have to throw it. That's <laughs> not the reason to do. Uh, but, but going and talking to customers or showing them what it is and interacting them with them was actually made us to get to the point where we can build a product that would end, end, end up selling. So building on kind of what you were saying about, uh, I, I was interested in you were talking about the Rock Angels and the advice you were getting. It was more about the spreadsheet and the data and how you did it. But did you also get advice, and that gets into how to sell your product, how to sell a product? You know, a lot of people, if they come from technical or financial industries, are not good at talking with people, getting up there. Uh, Brian, I'm going to pick on you. You were playing with your finger a bit, shows a bit of nervousness until you got into it. But did you get those kind of advice on how to talk to people, how to wave your hands around, show excitement, and those kind of things? Did you get that kind of advice, so not only to give it to your mock angels and get that initial presentation, but then to go out and sell to customers as well? And that's not just available through the mock angel program, but through the rest of engagement with I10, which is yeah. for any startups that are looking at it. Um, like through the I10 mentors match program, you can go through and see a bunch of mentors and reach out to them and have them help you on your pitch right. and learning how to present. Uh, and then also, I don't know how it goes for the EIR program, is that directly going to the mock angels? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we were assigned an entrepreneur in residence who then uh, would be working on me and I met with him on a weekly basis. And he would help me hone in on my pitch or hone okay. in for pitching to investors or for pitching for sales and um, for whatever I needed in order to get the feedback on. So, that's okay. so I was just going to say, so as a precursor to our investor readiness program, um, that's a separate application actually, to, you know, for any I-10 company has to kind of do that separate application um, and has to demonstrate a lot of traction in, other, in understanding a lot of key areas. So we have modules that help people work through their marketing, their customer discovery, their sales strategy, their product development, their operations. Like they need to set up a corporate structure that you know check up, on, you know those sorts of things. So we we, we want them to have the, and, and align with mentors at each of those key modules before they get ready to ask for money because that all has to come together and you can't spend. We don't want people to get into the investor readiness program um, and spend a lot of time having us poke holes in their business model that needs to be pretty tight going in. But you know, yeah, I think so one thing I would say is that my last tech startup that I worked on, I bootstrapped it, I put all my money into it, and I couldn't actually get company off the ground because I couldn't sell. And I came from technical background, I came from uh, entrepreneurial background, uh, but it was a large enterprise sales and I just couldn't do it. Uh, so when you ask for, I, I, I would go back to like what uh, uh, what some of the folks were saying is go, go and ask for that help. Uh, one of the things we did is in EIR program especially, Say, I don't, I, this is the area I'm struggling, and listen to their advice and go and take an action. Like, we have, this is the best free accelerator you can get. This is, that's how I looked at it. It's what you get out of it. And we specifically talked about, like, I don't know how to sell this, I don't know how to go this. Well, there are, there are uh, EIRs, so or there are advisors who does prof this professionally sell products. And you can just sit down with them, and then they can just give you one on one coaching or just give you action plan saying, these are the three things I want you to do. And uh, in this case, it was a different different story, but it was extremely, extremely helpful. And that's what I would recommend you do. 
uh, find find an EIR or find an advisor who has an expertise. And you can spend some time with them. So you'd be surprised if you're an entrepreneur. You'd be surprised how good you are at selling. Well, no, actually, I, I've done sales. I've done a lot of sales before, but it's always surprising to me even people in sales teams. Like I've run direct sales teams and I've done yeah. stuff like that. I sold software sales and stuff. But it's interesting how many people have great ideas, are really technical, and the product speeds, but just cannot communicate to people, totally. and they're trying to do it. It's just not. I yeah, absolutely. To, so yeah. I was interested in, in how that dynamic worked here. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the biggest challenges that you're touching on for um, entrepreneurs is that particularly if they've been very involved in the development of the product, you know, it's like giving birth to a baby. That baby's beautiful. Oh, yeah. And, and so, but, so, but, you know, but, but. so, 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 um, so the, the issue is that, that just kind of that closeness, that, that, that pride, that protectiveness, they get, a lot of times entrepreneurs, and I've been in those shoes too, get so caught up in that that they're not, telling their story in the right way or at the right level. And that's part of what we try to, to break through. Even sometimes people that are good sales people, it's just they're they're coming from a play, a different place um, when they're launching this product that they created. And um, so yeah, it's getting getting kind of your head in the right place to tell the story. And okay. train others to sell your product. That's a thing. Yeah, that's, that's a whole, not, that's they a whole other thing. thing. They think they can be the entire sales team oh. and somehow reach, you know, that's a different program. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys coming. Five minutes in the room, so if you have individual questions, you don't want to raise your hand. And more questions about our program, two of our EIRs up here, raise your hands, Jack and Quentin people that you get assigned when you're in the investor writing this program. If you have questions for them or for any of our panelists, feel free to come up and ask them individually. And thanks so much. Come back next month. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.